I modded Pokemon Fire Red, so all of my moves only have one power point. I played through this mod as a hardcore Nuzlocke, with your standard hardcore Nuzlocke rules. But along the way, I noticed that this run may be truly special. Here's the story of how I beat a hardcore Nuzlocke with one PP, completely deathless. Our journey begins in good old Pallet Town, and for our starter, we select Onion the Bulbasaur, who is the best starter for this challenge due to its favorable type matchups against the first two gyms as well as resisting the third. We immediately run into a problem when we're challenged by our rival, Kevin, and his Charmander. Onion only has Tackle and Growl, which on their own aren't enough to win after one use, but we can turn the tides. After running out of PP, we are forced to use Struggle for the first time. Struggle is a 50 base power physical move that does a little bit of recoil damage, but this is already stronger than our 35 base power tackle. So for this fight, we actually get a slight damage boost and defeat Kevin without any PP remaining. We run a quick errand for Professor Oak, grabbing a parcel form in Viridian City, and get access to Pokeballs as the run officially begins. On Route 1, we grab Cheese the Rattata, as well as Bone and Wing the Pidgey on Route 2. With our party starting to grow, we need to begin planning for Brock, who has two Rock-type Pokemon. Now, Cheese and Bone and Wing won't be able to touch them, and only one Vine Whip and Leech Seed from Onion might not be enough to win. We need an Ace in the Hole. The solution lies on Route 22, where thanks to our Pidgey and Rattata duplicates, we are guaranteed to catch Nanners the Mankey. Before the current level cap of 14, Nanners gets access to Low Kick and Karate Chop, fighting type moves that will help us against Brock's Rock types. With our secret weapon in our possession, we travel through Viridian Forest where we capture Kasu Martu the Caterpie. While her bug flying typing isn't the greatest, getting a Butterfree at level 10 with good stats and a solid moveset will help a lot with early game, although it is going to take a back seat while we fight Brock. Brock himself goes exactly as we planned it. He leads with Geodude, who Onion takes out with the Vine Whip. Then Onyx comes in, and we switch to Nanners to one-shot it. Now you might think, Onyx has such a high defense stat and you just have a Mankey. Well, let me tell you about Low Kick. Low Kick is a move that does more damage the heavier the target is. And I don't know if you can tell, but Onyx is kind of heavy. Due to Onyx's weight, Low Kick becomes a 120 base power super effective fighting move, which somehow still isn't enough to take it out. But Nanners also has Leer, so we can lower Onyx's defense, allowing Low Kick to take it out and get us the Boulder Badge. With a badge in hand, we finally get a pair of running shoes, so we can sprint over to Mount Moon. But on the way, we capture a Spearow on Route 3 that we named Boneless Wing, and inside Mount Moon, we capture Rock Candy the Geodude. We spelunk through many floors of Mount Moon, take out a couple of pesky Team Rocket Grunts, and get our hands on the Helix Fossil after defeating the greedy Super Nerd guarding it. From there, we can exit the cave and end up on Route 4, where we capture Gummy Snake the Ekans, before arriving in Cerulean City. Cerulean City is home to Gym Leader Misty, who may only have two Pokemon, but one of them is a Starmie. Luckily, we have a lot of encounters available to us from this point, but before we can access any of them, we need to face off against Kevin in front of the Nugget Bridge. His team hasn't gotten too strong yet. His only evolved Pokemon is a Pidgeotto, but we use Gummy Snake to get an Intimidate on it, as well as a Poison from Poison Sting, before going into our own Pidgeotto to finish it off. Nanners one-shots his Rattata, and then we bring in Cheese to take care of his Abra, which only knows Teleport. With one Mon left, Kevin sends in his Charmander, that he decided not to evolve for some reason, and we use Cheese to fire off a Hyper Fang, and we win. Now with Kevin out of the way, we take on the Nugget Bridge. The five normal trainers, as well as the Rocket Grunt that tries to recruit us, causes us little to no issues. On the other side of the bridge, we capture Beetroot the Oddish on Route 24, who I can tell is going to be a big help for Misty. On Route 25, we run into an Abra, which can be a massive boost to our party's firepower once it evolves. Unfortunately, we never get to see that happen, as it breaks out of the first ball I throw at it and teleports away. But we don't let that discourage us. At the end of Route 25, we find Bill, who had accidentally turned himself into a Pokemon. We help him turn back to normal, and as thanks, he gives us a ticket for the SS Hand. With the Nugget Bridge cleared, and the ticket in our possession, we could head to Vermilion City, the home of the third gym. Now, you may be rushing to the comments section to ask, why are you going to the third gym before you beat the second? Well, we aren't going to challenge the gym in Vermilion just yet. What we really want is an item we can find there. On our way over, we capture Chia the Meowth and travel underground beneath Saffron City to arrive in Vermilion, where we pick up the Old Rod. We use it to fish in Vermilion to capture Philea Fish the Magikarp. You can probably tell where I'm going with this, but with a level cap of 21, we're able to evolve this floppy fish into a Gyarados. The main reason we want Gyarados is because of its Intimidate ability, which will allow us to weaken Starmie's Swifts. Swift is Starmie's best tool to check any grass types I bring, so weakening it will in theory give Onion a chance to take it down. With our large Sea Serpent by our side, we are finally ready to challenge Misty. Misty leads with Staryu, who Nanners is able to 1v1 with its three attacking moves after Misty uses a potion. Then Starmie comes out. I pivot through Philea Fish, lowering Starmie's attack and go into Beetroot, who is able to land a massive Poison Powder. 
After that, I go back through Filet of Fish and into Onion. Now at minus 2 attack, Starmie sees no reason to use Swift over Water Pulse, which I already resist. Onion is able to land a Leech Seed, and the combination of Seeds and Poison slowly lowers Starmie's health until I believe I can go for a Vine Whip. Oh my god, don't confuse, don't confuse and we win. Oh my god, we're crazy. Thanks to Onion's heroics, we get the Cascade Badge. And it is time to go aboard the SSN. Off the pier in Vermilion, we find the Fabled Vessel. And while on board, we are once again challenged by Kevin, who has improved his team a little bit this time around. Bone and Wing leads the mirror match against Kevin's bird and is able to come out on top. Then comes Raticate, which lands a strong Hyper Fang on Nanners, but our monkey strikes back with a Karate Chop, taking it down. Next comes Kadabra, which knows a bit more than Teleport now. I switch into Cheese to tank a Confusion before landing a Hyper Fang, one-shotting Kadabra. Last is his Charmeleon. We go through Filet Fish and land a Tackle as well as a Bite, but not before getting burned. So we go into Rock Candy who fires off a Magnitude, exiling Kevin off the ship. Now we can head upstairs to the captain's quarters, where after one uncomfortable back rub, we receive the HM for cut, allowing us to enter the third gym. Lieutenant Surge is an electric type specialist, and we need as many Pokemon as we can find to counter him. In Diglett Cave, we find, you guessed it, a Diglett, which we capture and name Potato. Our little spud comes ready with Dig and Magnitude before the level cap of 24, both extremely strong and valuable attacks for a fight against the Lightning Lieutenant. But before we can fight him, we have to deal with his extremely annoying and luck-based gym puzzle that will definitely take us a long time to solve. Oh, wait, am I gonna get this first try? Wait, I just got that first try. Wait, wait, what, what the, wait, what is, wait, wait. I've, I've never had that happen before. I am now concerned that I've used up all my luck for this run, but I must press on. It was time to fight for a third badge. Surge leads with Voltorb, but Potato is blazing fast and burrows underground before Voltorb can touch it and destroys it with Dig the next turn. Pikachu comes in next and we roll low on Magnitude getting a five, but even still, never speak crud about the Spud and Diglett one shots Pikachu as well. Last is Raichu and I need to get Onion in before Raichu can set up too many double teams. In a challenge like this, you can imagine how difficult it would be if I were to start missing moves. So my makeshift plan was to pray that Onion lands at least one of Leech Seed or Poison Powder and then slowly let it whittle Raichu down. The only problem is that Raichu will be able to get off two double teams before I even have a chance to attack, so my odds are slim. Oh my god, okay, that's big. That's really big. Quick attack. Fine. Oh my god, he hits it. Onion, you god. Even after Surge used the full heal to get rid of Raichu's poison, we may as well attack, right? Well, that's lame. Oh, he hit the Razor Leaf, too. What is happening? Vine Whip. Shockwave, that's okay. If we hit this Vine Whip, I think we just win. Raichu, your double teams have no effect here. You literally just wasted two turns setting up double team. I'm sorry, buddy. Oh, what an easy game. With Onion coming up big once again, we now have three gym badges and can start our trek to Celadon City. With Cut at our disposal, we travel through Route 9, battle a few measly trainers, and arrive at Route 10, where we capture Meatball the Voltorb, giving us access to our first electric type. We rest at the Pokemon Center placed conveniently on the route and enter Rock Tunnel, where we capture Beans the Zubat. The cave itself is extremely dark, and there is very little we can see. Thankfully, we grab the Flash HM on the other side of Diglett Tunnel, and taught it to Chia, who can light the way for us. After battling most of the 15 trainers inside the labyrinth, we arrive on the other side of Route 10, leading us to Lavender Town. See here we could go through the Pokemon Tower, but we're gonna save that for later. Gallivanting through Route 8, we get lucky and capture a Growlithe before it can use Roar on us, and name it Kibble. We take another underground path beneath Saffron, and end up in Celadon City. Celadon is the home to many key locations in this game. We got the gym, the department store, and my favorite, the Cassie, I mean the game corner! The gift TV is cool and all, but I want that sweet Dratini waiting for me behind the prize counter, calling to me like those cheap toys you would get at a Chuck E. Cheese birthday party. The only way I can get it though is through gambling or spending an absurd amount of money, but don't threaten me with a good time. We take some time to spin the slots and grab our baby dragon that we named Pattaya. The department store is home to many essential items such as more TMs as well as evolution stones that we can use to evolve Kibble and Beetroot. Inside the gym, Kibble makes quick work of Erica's groupies and it's time to challenge Erica herself for the rainbow badge. As you can imagine, having an Arcanine and Golbat makes this fight a living nightmare for Erica's grass types. Erica leads with Victory Bell and I with Kibble. The Fire Pup lets loose a Flamethrower and takes Victory Bell down before it even has a chance to act. The same can be said about Erica's Tangela, which comes in next, as it dies to a single ember. This surprised me at first, but looking at it now, Tangela doesn't have the best special bulk. Last is Erica's Vileplume, and Kibble gets off a takedown and bite to get it just above 25%, so Erica won't use a potion. I then go into Beans, who takes an acid and finishes the fight with a single wing attack, four badges down. 
Wanting to celebrate, we head back to our favorite gambling spot, but we notice a Team Rocket Grunt isn't joining in on the fun. However, he still must be quite the gambler because he likes his odds and immediately challenges us to a battle, but Cheese is able to take him down without breaking a sweat. We chase him off and find a button that leads to Team Rocket's secret hideout. Now, I can turn a blind eye here, but I'm not gonna let a crime syndicate ruin the reputation of my favorite establishment. I have to act. Inside Rocket Hideout, we navigate the many floors, battle grunts as we see fit, and come across the lift key, which allows us to access the elevator. We head down to the bottom floor and come face to face with the head boss of Team Rocket, Giovanni, and I'm determined to send him packing. Giovanni leads with Onyx, and Onion is able to take it down with a Vine Whip. Then, Giovanni gets the genius idea to counter Onion with another rock and ground type in Rhyhorn. Just like you should get the genius idea to subscribe! And like the video if you're enjoying it so far. Less than 2% of my viewers are currently subscribed, so if we can increase that number, it'd go a long way to help supporting me in the channel. Thank you. One Razor Leaf later, and Giovanni is forced to resort to his last Pokemon, Kangaskhan. I pivot through Filet Fish to lower its attack and switch into Rock Candy, who takes little damage from any of Kangaskhan's attacks. Luckily, Kangaskhan misses Mega Punch on the switch anyway, and Rock Candy lands a crit brick break. The next turn, the battle is finished with a magnitude 7. Just like that, Giovanni flees, and the game corner is free to operate as per usual. Oh, and I guess we got the Silph Scope as well. Turns out this item is pretty useful. We can use it to see ghosts in the Pokemon Tower that we couldn't previously identify. We head back to Lavender Town, scale the tower, and thanks to our new Silph Scope, we capture Gumball the Ghastly, the only ghost type that we have access to during this run. But before we get to the top, we battle the restless spirit of a dead Marowak and calm it down so it can pass on. Atop the stairs it was guarding, we find a few more Team Rocket Grunts who are holding Mr. Fuji hostage. We scare off the Rocket Grunts, and as thanks for saving him, Mr. Fuji gives us the Pokey Flute, which allows us to progress, as well as capture one of the best encounters, not just in the game, but this challenge specifically, Snorlax. Snorlax boasts incredible bulk as well as a pretty high attack stat, but what makes it even better is its learn set. It comes with Headbutt at 70 base power, it learns Body Slam at 85 base power only a few levels after we catch it, and it can learn 80 base power strength once we get the HM for it. There are two places we can get our Snorlax, Route 12 and Route 16. I decided to get the Snorlax on Route 16 since we want to save Route 12 for a fishing encounter later on. We capture our beefy boy, and with all of the food-themed nicknames we have, Snorlax is able to eat the entire buffet, so we name him accordingly. Above where we just caught Snorlax lies a tucked away area behind a cut tree. On the other side of the gate, we get the HM for Fly, which not only allows us to travel between towns with ease, but gives us a strong move that we can teach to our flying Pokemon. Having to remove the Snorlax from Route 12 as well, we simply wake it up, enter battle, and run away. And then we can travel across what feels like the longest stretch of routes from one one city to another. Eventually, we end up in Fuchsia City. Here, we grab the Good Rod. This allows us to get more Water-type Pokemon other than Gyarados. And while Filea Fish is good, she currently has no Water-type attacks for us to use. With our Good Rod, we go to the little pond behind the Fisherman's House and catch Caviar the Poliwag. We then fly back to Route 12 and fish up Rangoon the Krabby. Right below it, on Route 13, we cast our line and reel in Cavatappi the Horsey. Lastly, on Route 15, we go and capture Cherry Pit the Venonat. In the back of Fuchsia lies the Safari Zone, where we can grab another encounter, as well as some important items. We're lucky enough to encounter a Rhyhorn, and another rock type would be a great addition to our... Oh. Anyway, in the deepest area of the Safari Zone, we find a set of gold teeth, as well as the HM for Surf, which not only allows us to traverse water later on, but allows us to teach a strong water move to a number of our Pokemon. Those gold teeth we found belong to the Safari Zone's Warden. We bring them to him, and he gives us the HM for Strength, another useful field and battle move that will go on multiple Pokemon. From this point, we could go and challenge the Fuchsia City Gym, but an interesting thing about this game's design is that Fuchsia's Gym Leader Koga, as well as Saffron's Gym Leader Sabrina, both have a level cap of 43. In order to fight both Gym Leaders with their level cap, without overleveling in between, we decide to progress the story as much as we can before having to fight either of them. The main thing that we need to do is take care of Team Rocket once and for all. Saffron City has been taken over by the crime gang, and they are currently hiding out in the Silphco building and holding its president hostage. We need to help him, but did I mention that this place has 11 floors? Well, luckily, this building is chock full of teleporters that will take us all over without even needing the stairs. A lot of the rooms are locked, but we find the key card we need to open them, and suddenly the entire building is free to roam, as long as you avoid the many rocket grunts lurking around. Eventually, it seems like we find where we need to go, but we see Kevin. He had the bright idea to wait in a random room in a building filled to the brim with criminals, hoping that we would show up and battle him. There are more important things at stake here, but he isn't going to let us pass otherwise, so we entertain his challenge. Kevin leads with Pidgeot, so I send him Buffet. I start off with a yawn so the bird eventually sleeps, and it goes with Wing Attack. I click Body Slam, but Pidgeot uses Feather Dance to sharply lower my attack. Body Slam does much less damage than I would have liked, so while Pidgeot is asleep, I pivot through Filet Fish and go back into Buffet, resetting my attack stat while lowering Pidgeot's as well. After that, Strength and Headbutt are enough to take it out, and then Kevin's Gyarados is next. I switch into Meatball while Gyarados uses Dragon Rage, and Meatball is able to outspeed and kill with Spark. 
Kevin then sends out Execute, and I bring in Kibble to counter it, but Execute is able to land a Stun Spore. This doesn't phase Kibble one bit, who hits with a Flamethrower through Paralysis to fry the eggs. Now comes Alakazam. And I'm not gonna lie, I don't have much to counter this, but the answer lies in Gumball. Normally, using a Poison type against a Psychic type is a bad idea, but Alakazam's only attacking move is Future Sight, which, at least in Generation 3, deals typeless damage and can't crit. This means that Gumball does not take super effective damage from it, and takes less than 50%. With this very specific damage window, we are able to bring Gumball in and put a curse on Alakazam that will slowly take it down. Now, I have to sacrifice half my health to do this, but if I crunch the numbers right, Gumball should be fine. One Shadow Punch and two turns of curse damage later, and Alakazam is down. This brings in Kevin's last Pokemon, Charizard. When the dragon switches in, Gumball takes the future side attack, but stays alive all according to plan. We go into Filet of Fish to take a flamethrower and use a Surf, but before we can attack, the Zard uses Smokescreen on me, and Surf misses. Now I have to resort to Rock Candy, and I need to hit him without more Smokescreens, since missing both of my Rock moves could spell disaster for us. I decide to Intimidate Pivot between Filet of Fish and Kibble until I can get Rock Candy and Smokescreen free. Eventually, I get her in on a flamethrower, but the next turn Charizard Smokescreens, and I miss Rock Throw. With everything on the line, I click Rock Blast. Oh, thank God. Okay. Woo -wee. Charizard goes down, and instead of offering to help us with the hostile takeover, Kevin ditches us. Just a tad inconsiderate. However, in the same room lies an NPC that just happens to have a Lapras they want to give us for free, since we came to help them out. We graciously accept Mr. Long John Silver, who has Perish Song, a move that kills any Pokemon that hears it after three turns. Add this on top of massive bulk and solid attacking stats, and this Lapras is primed to leave its mark on this run. We can hype up this encounter all we want, but there is still something we need to take care of. We need to fight Giovanni again, to free the president as well as the entire city. Giovanni leads with Nidorino, and I send out Potato. Potato outspeeds and unleashes an earthquaking, well, earthquake to get the KO. Then comes Kangaskhan, which for some reason only has normal type moves. This allows us to simply go into Gumball, place a curse on Kangaskhan, and then wait out the turns until it dies by exchanging moves that can't hit each other. The Rhyhorn that comes in third is easily cleaned up by a Vine Whip from Onion, and last is Nidoqueen. I go into Gyarados, who uses a Surf to get it down to a little under half, and then go into Rock Candy, who ends the fight with a Magnitude, crumbling the Mafioso's hopes and dreams. Upon his defeat, Giovanni declares that he will return eventually, but we know that when he does, we will be ready. He, along with the entirety of Team Rocket, flees Saffron, and the city is saved. As thanks for our good deed, the president awards us with a Master Ball, which, looking back, I realized I never used, but that's besides the point. From this point forward, the only way to progress the story is to be able to use Surf to head to Cinnabar Island. But for that, we will need the Soul Badge from Fuchsia, so it's time for our back-to-back -back gym fights. First on the chopping block is the ninja, Koga, and his poison types. Koga sends out a coughing first, and we debut Van Candy the Hypno, who we caught as a drowsy on Route 11 way back before the second gym, but I couldn't really find a way to integrate him into the script, so here he is now. Van Candy uses a single psychic to one-shot the coffin, which brings out Muck. The problem with Muck is that it has Minimize, as well as Acid Armor, moves that make it difficult for me to take it out with limited attacks. Thankfully, it only has Sludge as a damaging move, and its fourth move is Toxic, neither of which can really hurt Gumball. I bring in the Ghoul and put a curse on Muck. You know the drill from here. We wait out Muck until it slowly dies from its curse and Koga uses up all of his potions. Koga then resorts to his second serving of coughing, but just like Muck, this one can't really hurt Gumball. I stay in to eliminate the risk of it exploding, and actually kill it exclusively with struggles, while the coughing also struggles to damage me. Last is the big boy Weezing. I switch into Filet of Fish while Weezing uses Sludge, and the next turn I land a Hydro Pump, but after a smoke screen, I decide not to press my luck, and go into Buffet, who can't be poisoned thanks to the immunity ability. Koga doesn't seem to get the memo as he tries to toxic me and fails much to his chagrin. A Body Slam as well as a Paralysis bring him to the brink of defeat, and there's nothing he can do but use a single full heal, while Buffet secures the gym badge with a single headbutt. With five badges in our case, it is immediately time to challenge for our sixth. In Saffron City, we find Sabrina and her psychic types. She leads with a Kadabra, and I send in Potato. Here we have a battle between two glass cannons, and the winner is whoever can fire first. The victor in this scenario is Potato, who uses Earthquake and takes Kadabra out in one hit. Then comes in probably the biggest problem of this fight, and oddly enough, it's a Mr. Mime. This Mr. Mime is Barrier, Calm Mine, Psybeam, and Baton Pass. If I can't get rid of this thing before it sets up and passes along all of its buffs to Alakazam, this run might as well be over. Potato rolls a magnitude 7, which is barely not enough to kill, and Mr. Mime uses Barrier to sharply raise its defense. Sabrina uses a potion, and my slash doesn't do a lot. We are slowly entering very scary territory. I switch into Kibble while Mr. Mime uses Calm Mind. A flamethrower brings it close to death, but Mr. Mime sets up another barrier. A bite from this range will kill, but Sabrina uses another potion. The bite lands, but even with an ember, it isn't enough before Mr. Mime uses Baton Pass. 
At this point, I feel like the run is over, but she decides to go into Venomoth, oddly enough, a Pokemon I can deal with. I go into Long John Silver and use Parasol. After three turns, she will be forced to either let Venomoth die or switch out. Either way, those boosts will not be staying on the field. I go into Boneless Wing and use Fly to stall right before the last turn of Parasol. On the final turn, Sabrina chooses to go back into Mr. Mime, and Boneless Wing misses Fly, but gets the KO next turn with Drill Peck. This brings Venomoth back out, who dies to a combination of Aerial Ace and Peck. Lastly is Alakazam. I bring in my specially bulky Buffet, and Alakazam sets up a future sight. But before it can hit, Buffet tanks a Psychic and hits hard with Body Slam, which, by some miracle, is enough to bring Alakazam down and get us our sixth badge. Now that we can use Surf, we can take a quick trip to the Power Plant, where we capture Tiramisu the Magnemite. This is one of the best Pokemon you can get in this game since it's the only Steel type you get access to in the main story. We then fly back to Fuchsia and capture a Tentacle on Route 19 that we name Calamari. And in Seafoam Islands, we capture a little Psyduck which we name Grapes. Personally, I don't feel like navigating all the way through Seafoam Islands, so I take an alternate path south of Pallet Town in Route 21, where we take a quick pit stop and snag Spaghetti the Tangela. Before we know it, we arrive at Cinnabar Island. Here we find a Pokemon research lab that employs a scientist capable of reviving fossilized Pokemon. I'm about to give him my Helix Fossil to revive Omanyte, when I remember that there is another fossil Pokemon that I have access to, Aerodactyl. It is clearly the best choice for us here. In Pewter City, we enter a room tucked in the back of the museum, and here we find a scientist that conveniently wants us to revive an old Amber because he believes there's a Pokemon in there. Luckily for him, I know there's a Pokemon in there, so I accept his offer, and fly back to Cinnabar where I revive it into McNugget the Aerodactyl. The island's gym is locked and I need to find a way in, so I decide to explore the Pokemon Mansion. Inside the rundown manor, we capture Munchkin the Coughing, and are met with a series of gates that need to be activated by switches. I may be 23, but this kid's puzzle still found a way to slip me up a few times. But with enough patience, we make it to the basement, and find the secret key to unlock the gym. The gym itself isn't a challenge, the puzzle is just a series of quiz questions, and if we get one wrong, we have to fight a trainer. But if you have been even paying half attention while playing this, you shouldn't get any wrong. TM28? Contains Tombstoney? With our knowledge tested, we gather all the water and rock types we can muster and take on the bald mustachio himself, Blaine. Blaine leads with the Growlithe, and I send out Calamari. Our giant jelly one shots his pup with a bubble beam, making Blaine send in Ponyta, who meets the same fate when met with Calamari Surf. Next is Rapidash, and since I'm out of water moves, I switch to Rock Candy, who takes a Fire Blast and immediately gets burned, so I have to make a slight change of plans. I switch into Kavatapi, who resists another Fire Blast, and she's able to outspeed a horse that literally has the words Rapid and Dash in its name, killing it with a single Surf. Blaine's final Pokemon is his Arcanine. I go into Filet Fish while Arcanine launches a Fire Blast. I try for a Hydro Pump to get the KO, but I miss. A second Fire Blast hits, and I'm down to half. Risking a crit here, I go for a Surf and bring Arcanine within Dragon Rage range, while he misses a Fire Blast. Blaine decides not to heal, and his last hope goes down to a D-Rage, and we now have 7 badges. Upon leaving the gym, we run into Bill, who invites us to join him on a trip to the Sevi Islands to help him with the PC system there. We could lend a hand, but I have an 8th badge to get, so Bill's gonna have to wait. And he's gonna be waiting forever because I'm not helping him. Our last badge awaits us in Viridian City, as the gym leader, who has long been missing, has finally returned. Inside, we find the leader to be none other than Giovanni, who claims to be using this gym as a hideout until he's able to revitalize Team Rocket, and we can't let that happen. The battle begins as Giovanni sends out his first of two Rhyhorns, and I lead with Cavatapi. Our seahorse outspeeds and KOs the Rhyhorn with a water gun, bringing in Doug Trio. Thankfully, this Doug Trio doesn't have Arena Trap, allowing me to switch into Filet of Fish while Doug Trio goes for an earthquake that doesn't affect us. The following turn, Doug Trio lands a crit slash, but hardly phases Filet of Fish who takes the trio down with a Surf. This makes Giovanni send out his second, stronger Rhyhorn, which I switch into Onion while Rhyhorn uses Scary Face. And even after having her speed halved, Onion is able to outspeed and get the kill with a Vine Whip. Fourth is Nidoqueen, and thanks to the Levitate ability, Gumball can avoid any Earthquakes here. We cast a Curse, and the only move Her Majesty has that can hurt us is Poison Sting, which only does one damage. This allows us to stall by switching in between Munchkin and Gumball, but for some reason, Curse doesn't kill after 4 turns, leaving Nidoqueen on 1 HP, so we go into Filet of Fish to get an Intimidate off while Giovanni heals, and resume our switching between Gumball and Munchkin, having Giovanni use up all his potions until he finally runs out, and the Queen goes down. But when a Queen goes down, in comes a King to avenge her. The only problem is that Nido King has pretty much the same moveset as Nido Queen, and he can't really touch us. So Gumball is able to get off a Nightshade, and then a Crit Shadow Punch, which wins us the battle and secures our 8th and final badge. Now that we've completed the Gym Challenge, it's time to take on the Pokemon League. 
But before we can even get to Victory Road, Kevin meets us on Route 22 for another fight. He never seems to learn, and leads with his Pidgeot as always. So I lead with Tiramisu. Pidgeot can't even do so much as tickle us, so it decides to use Feather Dance to lower our physical attack, unaware that we were about to blast it out of the sky with a special Thunderbolt. This forces Kevin's hand early, as he goes right into Charizard. I go into McNugget, who eats a Flamethrower while holding a Rossberry in case of burn. And then we are able to outspeed an Oko with Ancient Power. Then comes Gyarados, so we go into Long John Silver while it sets up a Rain Dance. Kevin doesn't realize that we have Water Absorb and tries to Hydro Pump us, to no avail. And all Kevin can do is use Twister, while we get off a Body Slam which paralyzes. And then we use Surf, which is able to kill thanks to the rain that Gyarados put up. Then Kevin sends out Rhyhorn, so we go into Onion on a takedown and kill with Vine Whip. Fifth is Alakazam, and while Kevin gets greedy and sets up Calm Mind, I bring in Buffet, who is able to get the KO with a single Body Slam damage free. Last is Execute. I stay in, getting off a strength that doesn't quite kill, while the eggs put me to sleep. It then starts hitting me with solar beams, that even with a critical hit, aren't enough to bring me below half. Buffet rises from his slumber, and makes some scrambled eggs with a headbutt, winning us the battle. Now, with hopefully, no other distractions in our way, we can venture towards Victory Road. We head through each checkpoint, verifying that we have all 8 badges, and we can finally face our final obstacle before the Elite Four. Victory Road is one giant strength puzzle, with a bevy of strong trainers throughout. Now, this maze is going to be a challenge. That is, if they actually put trainers in locations where I was required to fight them. But no, we are able to speed through Victory Road without having to fight a single one of them. And before you know it, we are at the Pokemon League. We are finally here, the final challenge of this run. The first thing we need to do is scour every corner of the region to gather as many berries and elixirs as possible, so that we are able to deal with status conditions as well as be full on PP, or as full as we can get. We then go back to the PC and begin to strategize, and after some meticulous planning, we decide on a team. The six Pokemon that will help bring us to a deathless victory are Kibble, Tiramisu, McNugget, Buffet, Long John Silver, and a fully evolved Pattaya who is making their debut. It hurts to not bring Onion with us, and she was in the plans for a long time, but sadly, there were just simply better options. With our preparations complete, it was time for the final gauntlet. Up first in the Elite Four is Ice-type Specialist Lorelei. She starts off with a Dugong, and I send out Tiramisu, who is able to start the battle off strong, outspeeding and killing with a Thunderbolt. This brings in Cloyster, and after it's sent in, Tiramisu eats one of only two Lepa Berries we have, in order to get its Thunderbolt charge back. From there, Thunderbolt kills, but so does our weaker electric move, Spark. So we opt for that, and Tiramisu gets an easy double kill. Third is Slowbro, and its main goal is to set up Amnesias to boost its defense. I go into Long John Silver, who uses Parish Song, so that Slowbro will either have to switch and lose all of its boosts, or die. Long John Silver is able to get off an Ice Beam and Body Slam, dealing a little under half HP to Slowbro before it's time to switch, and I go into Tiramisu. Lorelei opts to switch as well, going into Jinx. From here, I go into Kibble while Jinx uses Lovely Kiss, but we gave our dog a little treat before the battle, a Lumberry, to stave off any sleep from Lovely Kiss or a Freeze from Ice Punch. Kibble is now free to use Flamethrower, and Jinx, quite frankly, can't handle the heat. Next is Lapras, so I switch into Buffet on a Confuse Ray, but our Person Berry heals us. Lapras decides to Ice Beam next, and with no freeze, Buffet is able to use Yawn, ensuring that Lapras will be asleep soon. Lapras decides to Confuse Ray again, and Buffet ends up hitting himself. So now after Lapras falls asleep, I can safely go into Tiramisu. From here we Thunderbolt, which doesn't quite take it out, and Lapras wakes up right away and Confuse Rays. The next turn, I know Lorelei is going to heal, so I go for a Thunder Wave, and Tiramisu is able to fight through Confusion and land it. The next turn, I switch into Buffet who eats a Surf. From here, Buffet uses Body Slam, which deals a little under half, and Lapras gets off another Surf but doesn't crit. Next, I go for Headbutt, which has a chance to flinch, and adding that on top of the chance for Lapras to be paralyzed increases the odds that it can't attack. Buffet lands and Lapras flinches. Lorelei doesn't heal the turn after, allowing us to defeat it with Strength. This brings Slowbro back out, and I go to check how much PP I have left, but accidentally command Snorlax to struggle. Luckily, Slowbro decided to yawn, so we were able to get some free damage off before I switch into Long John Silver. From here, we surf and bring Slowbro low enough so Lorelei uses her last potion. Even though from here we're out of PP, Slowbro only has Surf and Ice Beam, which can hardly damage Long John Silver, and we are free to struggle it to death, taking it out and defeating the first Elite Four member. Next on the agenda is the Musclehead himself, Bruno. He starts with an Onyx, and Long John Silver is able to come in and take it down with an Ice Beam. Second is Hitmonchan, and I'm under the impression that it's gonna use Sky Uppercut, so I go into Pattaya. However, the AI sees that Lapras is faster than Hitmonchan, so it decides to click Rock Tomb, which is super effective on Pattaya and crits. I need to find a way to get Pattaya in on quite literally any move other than Rock Tomb, so I don't have my speed reduced. I switch into Tiramisu while Hitmonchan attempts to counter and it does nothing. Now you would expect Hitmonchan to click a fighting type move against the Steel type, right? I think so too, so I go back into Pattaya. But Bruno reads me like a book, using Rock Tomb again, much to my dismay. However, we are still faster than Hitmonchan and fire off a wing attack to take it out. This brings him a champ. 
who is one of the scariest Pokemon in the Elite Four with its high attack stat, bulk up, rock tube, and cross chop. I need to be in against Machamp without a speed drop here so I can get the kill with Fly before he uses rock tube on me. Luckily, I find out I'm just a hair faster than Machamp still, even with a speed drop, thanks to the 10% speed boost in the Lightning Badge, allowing us to get in the air before Machamp can attack. The entire run then rests on us hitting a 95% accurate fly, which connects, killing Bruno's ace. Fourth is Hitmonlee, so I bring in Kibble, who lowers its attack and is able to kill with a flamethrower into extreme speed. Last is Bruno's second Onyx, and we bring in Long John Silver on an Earthquake so that we can end the battle with the Surf, getting us halfway through the Elite Four. Third on our list is Agatha, who claims to be a ghost specialist, but her entire team is poison. She starts the bout off with her first of two Gengars, and I lead with Kibble. With the boost from the Volcano Badge, Kibble is able to land the 90% accurate overheat and kill. This brings in Golbat, so I switch into Tiramisu, who is tickled by an air cutter. They then shake off a Confuse Ray thanks to a Person Berry I had at hold, and launches a Thunderbolt to get the KO. Third is Haunter, and this one can be a little scary, since it can mean look and then set up a curse. I go back to Kibble on a Hypnosis, but wake up with a Lumberry. The next turn, Kibble uses Flamethrower that doesn't quite kill, and I'm put to sleep again. I decide to try and stay in, but after Agatha heals and I don't wake up, I realize I need to pivot my strategy. I switch into McNugget, and Haunter uses Curse, taking half of its HP. This puts it in range for McNugget to take it out next turn with Ancient Power, and I am more than fine with taking two turns of Curse damage. Now Agatha sends out Arbok, and I go into Pattaya while Arbok goes for Iron Tail. It doesn't get the defense drop, and Pattaya is able to outspeed and kill with Earthquake, bringing out her last Pokemon, a second Gengar. I stay in with Pattaya to try to get an attack off, but Gengar outspeeds and puts me to sleep with Hypnosis. I don't wake up, and the following turn, Gengar uses Nightmare, which deals a substantial amount of damage for every turn I'm asleep. I decide to switch into Tiramisu on a Sludge Bomb that has no effect so I can try and Thunder Wave it, but Gengar lands another Hypnosis and I'm slowly running out of options. I go into Buffet on a Nightmare so I can try and put it to sleep with Yawn, but Gengar lands another Hypnosis. My last option here before things get really dicey is Long John Silver. I make the switch and take a Sludge Bomb that actually ends up poisoning me, which in this case is amazing because now I can't be put to sleep. The following turn, Gengar lands a crit sludge bomb, but Long John Silver eats it up before singing a Paris song that will end this battle in due time. While I wait out the turns, I switch into Tiramisu on a sludge bomb, and for the next two turns, Gengar tries everything it can to take Tiramisu down. But even with multiple turns of Nightmare and a Shadow Ball, it is just not enough to kill, and eventually Gengar faints, winning us the fight. We now only had one Elite Four member before the champion, and it's against Dragon Master Lance. He leads with a Gyarados, so we use Tiramisu. The best that Gyarados could throw at us is a single Dragon Rage, before Tiramisu uses Spark, taking it out. This brings in one of Lance's two Dragonairs. I switch in Pattaya while Lance sets up a Safeguard. The next turn, I outspeed and defeat this Dragonair with a Dragon Claw, only for Lance to immediately bring in his second one. I go for Fly, and after not killing, Dragonair uses Thunder Wave, but the Cherry Berry I equipped cures Pattaya. Lance opts to heal the next turn, and I hit with Earthquake, before killing the next turn with a Surf. This brings out Lance's own Dragonite, and with all of my PP spent, I know I'm not winning this mirror match. I simply switch into Lapras, while Dragonite sets up another safeguard, and the next turn, something weird happens. Dragonite uses Wing Attack, but it hits himself? I don't know if something strange got changed with the code when I made the mod, but this has no effect on the rest of the fight since Wing Attack has no chance of killing me anyway, and the Ice Beam I use is guaranteed to kill regardless. That was a bit strange, but we stick with our same strategy as before. Lance's last Pokemon is Aerodactyl, so I go into Tiramisu, who dodges two Ancient Power Boosts before using Thunderbolt, ending the battle with only one left remaining in the challenge. With the Elite Four defeated, the one thing standing between us and a deathless victory is the champion, who is none other than Kevin himself. He had beaten us to the title of champion, but it was time to take it for ourselves and defeat him one final time. The final bout begins with Kevin leading with good old reliable Pidgeot. However, the only thing reliable about it is how easy it is to kill. I use Tiramisu, who takes an aerial ace and picks up the first KO with a Thunderbolt. Kevin resorts to Charizard next, and Tiramisu restores its Thunderbolt PP with our second and final Lepa Berry. I switch into McNugget, who gets hit with a crit fire blast but it is completely safe as we are holding a Rossberry, ensuring that the next turn we are able to outspeed and kill with Ancient Power. This brings in Gyarados, and while Kevin goes for a Hydro Pump, I switch into Long John Silver to make use of Water Absorb. Now that I'm not baiting Hydro Pump, I go into Tiramisu again on a Dragon Rage, and now they'll need to dodge a Hydro Pump crit. But oddly enough, Kevin decides to use Dragon Rage again, and I'm free to use another Thunderbolt for the kill. With half of his team gone, Kevin sends out Rhydon, and baiting Earthquake, I switch into Pattaya, who outspeeds and kills with Surf, making Kevin send an Alakazam. I stay in here and Alakazam uses Psychic, which hurts Pattaya, but he is more than fine as he fires back with Earthquake, which just doesn't kill. The next turn, Kevin heals while I go for Dragon Claw, which does about half. Not wanting to die from a crit Psychic, I go into Buffet while Kevin sets up Reflect, 
The next turn, Buffet eats a Psychic and goes for a Body Slam that barely doesn't kill either. Kevin uses another potion, and after using Strength and Headbutt, Alakazam is once again in the red, and I know that Kevin is going to heal again, and I'm tired of him weakening my physical attacks. So it's time to attack him on the special front. In comes Kibble. Kevin heals as predicted, and on the next turn, Alakazam goes for another Reflect, but I go for Bite, which does about half. The next turn, Kibble tanks a Psychic, and Alakazam finally goes down to Flamethrower. And now, Kevin sends out his final Pokemon, Executor. From here, a simple overheat will kill. I just need to hit with 90% accuracy. Hit this overheat, and we're going home. Yes! Oh my god! Kibble connects, burning the palm tree to the ground and solidifying our deathless victory. With Kevin's reign as champion lasting no longer than a few hours, we are inducted into the Hall of Fame as champions. And that is the story of how I beat a hardcore Nuzlocke with only one PP, Deathless. Thanks for watching.